today started his career at age 28, moving quickly from guest starring roles on popular television shows to major films like Places in the Heart, The Color Purple, come on, and the popular Lethal Weapon series. He's a producer of thoughtful films, a humanitarian, an amazing actor, and just an awesome human being. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to, and I want you to give him a warm, and it gets pretty warm here, right? A warm Phoenix, Com Phoenix Comic Con welcome to one of the hardest working people in cinema today. Thank you very much for being with us today, sir. We're very honored to have you here. And to start off with, um, I just want to ask you a couple of quick questions of my own because I'm, I'm nosy. And uh, I wanted to know, what was it that actually got you interested and started in theater and acting to begin with? Um, well, um, in, in 1967, I was a student at at San Francisco State University, uh, majoring in economics. And we invited um, a very extraordinary poet and writer out named uh, Amiri Baraka, who was Nero Jones in, to start what we call a, a community communication theater uh, project, which included dance theater, and it's a community project. And he, right. Gal his presence galvanized the community itself and brought various artists together. And so I was a student there and a member of the, the Black Student Union who had facilitated his coming out there. And so uh, that's the first time I ever done theater. I was 20 years old. I had never been on stage before in my life. Not even a, a small, maybe something in a small Christmas play at church or something. And so uh, I, I did some theater, and then after I, I finished, after I graduated, I stopped doing theater. And I, I um, started working. I worked in community development and in the uh, Office of Community Development and Model Cities programs in San Francisco out of the mayor's office in 1971. And so I, it was one of those kind of jobs that, exciting, you know, I was looking for something to kind of find a way to relax or something like that. And I started doing improvisation. I ended up in the American Conservatory of Theater in 1975 at a night program. And then from there, I, I did theater in San Francisco, which was very vibrant at the time. Places like the Magic Theater and, and uh, other theaters, Eureka Theater, very vibrant theater. Uh, uh, right there, a lot of you know. I did Sam Shepard, uh, Suicide and B Platt. I did this is a lot of theater, and then I ended up in. But mainly the key was was really that I found a writer who wrote for me, and he was a South African writer named Athol Fugard. Fugard. So not only was the work that I did, he taught me the craft of acting, but also also taught me for it. It, it also was was gave me some a process in which I was able to say what was important to me in the world and whose side of the world I was on. And it was just at the, at the crescendo of, of um, uh, the anti-apartheid movement which led me to end up doing Mandela in 1986 and even becoming a good friend of Nelson Mandela as well. So I, I, I think that part of it was uh, the fact that I, I felt that the, the work that I had to do in some ways had to be purposeful. And, and that was the, the main thing that pushed me forward in there. And that it, for me, it had value. I said, this has value. So often I refer to myself as a cultural worker, which means that the work that I do, I feel has value. And of all your 
philanthropic, I cannot speak today, I'm sorry, <laughs> of all your philanthropic or humanitarian activities over the years, is there any one specific one that has really touched you significantly or more deeply than others? Well, you know, sometimes, it's really, I always say, make it say that it's, it's what I do tomorrow, what's important, not what I did in the past. But I, I think for me, uh, when, when I was a student and, and we were all talking about an end to the system of apartheid, it wasn't on people's radar screen. Uh, and to know that, that all, uh, throughout my life, throughout my life, throughout my young adult life, that, that I had some vision that, that perhaps we can struggle enough, fight enough, and present the argument of, argument of that the system of apartheid would end and that Nelson Mandela would be free. So I think out of all the things that, that you were able to say that were part of my life, that I was right, right in the middle of, whether it was through my work as an artist, whether it was I through my work in, in, in various organizations, meeting men and women who were in exile and couldn't go home, to see them go home, to be, be home, go home after years and years and years. I know people who had been able to go to South Africa for 20, 30 years, and they were able to go home. And I think if that was, if you were to say the signature thing in my life that I was, I was. Um, um, glad I was involved in. It's, uh, it, was, it was part of that history. And, and the great Paul Robeson once said that, that uh, every generation makes its own history and is judged by the history they make. And so I think all the things that involved, whether it was being a child of the Civil Rights Movement and being able to watch my, my parents mature and grow as a process to that, and also to be involved in issues around social justice, whatever they've been, and particularly around the, the, the end of apartheid was something that, that I, I, I want, I'm very proud that I was there, present at the time when that happened. We're going to stay, start taking uh, questions from the audience here in just a sec. I just have one last one because it's one of my favorite films. Lethal Weapon was one of your most popular films in your earlier career. And you really seem to have an amazing chemistry with your co-stars. Was, was the making of the Lethal Weapon films as much fun off camera as it looked like it was? Because like, you seem to be like really getting along well. Oh man, man, uh, it, it was so wonderful to work with Mel Gibson. And I love Mel. Mel is such a great friend of mine. And, and to be able to work with him because of the level of just, I think, it, you know, sometimes you don't see this work, but there's a level of genius and ingenuity there and generosity. So when all those things meet in one time, you have a joke. It's just a great time working. And, and each time that I, whenever I think about Lethal Weapon and Dick Donner and everything else, someone just mentioned say, someone said they had just met Dick Donner and a big smile came on my face and <laughs> came up to my table. And it's because of that, you know, and, and I mean, they're, they're, it was really a great, great to work in, to bring Joe in, uh, and uh, all the, all, everyone who was, here, who was added to the cast at any time. It was just really, really wonderful. And so, yeah, I mean, it, for, for me, it was certainly the most, the most certainly the most successful uh, part of my career. And it also allowed me to do some other things, like to sleep with anger, a movie I did, or the Saint of Fort Washington with Charles Burnett directing, or the Saint the Saint of Fort Washington, a movie about two homeless men that I did with Matt Dillon, you know, and other things that it, it kind of like became the, the the focal point because it was a franchise film, you know, and then I, you know at the time I had a great agent too, Arnold Rifkin, man, it was like a brother to me, we, it was like, almost exactly the same age, exactly the same age. And we went through the same, but he was my, my agent, and he would find and fight for me, you know, in some ways. I mean, really fight for me and leverage, try to find the leverage something else, because he represented Blue, uh, Bruce Willis, he represented Stallone, everything else. So, and Whoopi, so he was leveraging, always leveraging, you know, something for me. And, and that was that. But th those, those were, to be able to kind of be able to have that kind of fran franchise film. 
I, would, I remember the, the second one, which was about, uh, you know, laundering cougarines, you know. The film, it, 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 says, it says it was it was banned from South Africa, so they would, yeah. they, they would show it in South Africa. So on the one hand, we do a, a popular film, you know, a film that, that certainly, uh, with this first, the first, the first one out, suggested that it's going to be there would be a sequel. We do a popular film, and it's banned from South Africa. It don't get better than that, you know. <laughs> you know, I mean, really, in a sense, you know. We're not talking about the word having value, having value, and feeling that your work has value, in a sense, right. you know. And it was inherent there in in, 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 in *Lethal Weapon* as well, because there were other morals to the story, whether it's drugs in the first one or whether it's uh, uh, South Africa in the second one, or whether it's proliferation of um, guns in the community in the third one, or immigration in the fourth one. So on the one hand, there was some sort of general overriding theme, theme beyond just the action and, 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 and the humor in a sense, you know? But it, the way in which, the way in which uh, I think the writers, uh, uh, Joel Silver, one of the producers, and, and also Dick Donovan, and we're able to kind of put these away together in some sort of cogent way, in some sort of way that may have allowed people to enjoy themselves as a movie experience, but also come out of feeling, feeling something else as well. Yeah. All right, and I see there's quite a few of you out there that are itching to ask him some questions, so let's start over here on this side of the room. And your name? My name's Hannah. Okay. It's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Glover. How you doing? <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, I have a question about Lonesome Dove and your work as Deeds. I, I'm sorry, a question about what? About Lonesome Dove and your work as Deeds. Uh, and I wanted to know what drew you to that role, and then if you wanted to share an interesting story about the filming with us. Well, you know, I, it's a interesting because uh, I did Lonesome Dove and and in 1988, I think we saw shooting again in 1988. And it's certainly one of the one of the great uh, miniseries of all time, you know. And um, even though Deese didn't have a lot to say, there was something you know, I was kind of building a storyline around Deese, and and I think. The storyline I built around Thies was that he was a black Seminole Indian. And if you know a little bit of history about black Seminole Indians, it made their way after an agreement with, with the U.S. government after three wars, that Seminole Indians had three wars, starting with, with at 19, I think 1816, three wars that lasted over a period of about, uh, well, oh, oh, 30 something years, three different wars. After that war came, those wars came General Jackson, President Zachary Taylor, President, and Dade, General Colonel Dade, Dade County came out of the war. And so I made him a, a, a black Seminole Indian because after they made an agreement and went to Oklahoma and places, they fled because the agreement was, 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 was not upheld. They fled across the Rio Grande and worked for Santa Ana's government until after the Emancipation Proclamation. Then they came back over to Rio Grande, and you see plaques all around Texas where they were, became scouts for the Texas Rangers and for the U.S. Army as well. So I, that's the way I, I figured out Deese was a black Seminole Indian who would come back to, because he had a different kind of consonants about himself, you know. And I was able to use the, the form of that, 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 that idea when I did Buffalo Soldiers of uh, TNT and made John Horse, which is a traditional name for black Seminole Indian. John Horse had some of the same kind of history as these, these did as well. And, I, I, you know, I think, I th think the, move, the movement of that, you know, it's just what I felt like that everyone in that film, you know, from every single one, from, uh, um, um, I, I, what's my man's name? Uh, uh, every, every single character belonged in that film. Every single person who played in that film belonged in that film. They looked like they belonged in the film. There's a wonderful uh, coffee table 
uh, uh, photograph book uh, uh, that, that was taken by the, the, the screenwriter who adapted the play. Uh, and, and it's really beautiful, beautiful about what it was they shoot on that film, you know. And there were great stories, you know. There was a lot of, you know, Robert Duvall is his own person, you know what I'm saying? And then you have all these different energies and everything else. And, and But I, I tell you, man, I tell you, man, it was such a, a really wonderful experience in the be, you know, and I guess that scene at the end, you know, as um, really, uh, really, really special. I, I, and I, I use that term, I said Black like Samuel, my grandma's part Choctaw. So, so there, there's, there's a Native American blood that runs through my veins as well. So this next year will be the 20th year of this release. That's when it came out, just in an all-star game from 1995. And I was in the, I live in San Francisco, and I was in the supermarket shopping, and I was in the vegetable department, the vegetable and fruit department, and as I passed by, a young boy about your age looked up at me and whispered to his mother, Mom, there's the coach. <laughs> No, I think the best memory is the impact that it had. And another memory, I went to an event. Um, first, I went to two events. One event was, uh, these were students at Boston University. And they invited me to speak there about, you know, uh, you know just to speak. And I think it was um, a, 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 a student event there. And so the a group of the students came up to me and said, Mr. Glover, would it be all right, would you be offended, these are college students, would you be offended if when you came on stage, we all got up in the audience and did the wave? <laughs> Which they actually did. In National, when I was in Nashville, Tennessee, I was speaking at the, the National Association of Collegiate Activities, which were all students. Now, to tell you the impact the film had, these were all college students who would decide who, did, who they wanted to bring to on their campus to speak. And there were about eight or nine hundred of them. And when I, when I came in, and I was announced to come in, they got up in the audience and all of them did. They did the way. So those are my best memories of it. I remember the impact that it had on people, the fact that, 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 that that's, you know, my grandson has seen it a couple of times. He's 10 years old. And then young people like you and uh, still look at it. Thank you. Sensibility to that, you know. I mean, there, 
their 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 uh, their their favorite westerns that I have that I, I I can look at over and over and over again. You know, like like Paul Newman in Ombre. You know, <laughs> I love that one with Richard. Hunt. And I well, my favorite series of all time was Half Gun Will Travel with Richard Boone. You know what I'm saying? So there you go. I know you got some happy class in Washington. But so I grew up on westerns, you know. You know, Rifleman is on television, or you could go on and on and on and on and on. So the opportunity to get on a horse and play in the western, there's a whole different other kind of perspective when you're on a horse, you know, in a sense, you know. And and if you, you get a chance to do it, I mean, Deeds and that, that white that white horse he had on. I remember in Silverado, I had three horses that I was riding every day for six months almost. Just about every day for six months when I did Silverado, man. And I have I have my three horses, they all look the same, but I knew which one would give me the best, you know, they the, the, the one was the runner, you know, and 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 one and, and it was beautiful. It's beautiful, you know. And I remember when when I uh, when I had, uh, when we, before we started, we had about four weeks of rehearsal. And when I picked up that Henry Rice rifles, I would almost broke my, oh, it was so heavy, you know. I, I would stand up in my room and I would use it as a kind of like pumping iron or something like that. <laughs> I'd put over this hand and this hand and this hand and this hand. But there's something about, so romantic about that, you know, about that, about doing a Western. And it's a part of that. And, and I did a lot of research, you know, about about Westerns, you know, and particularly black people in the West, you know, because Lawrence Kasdan came up to me and said, well, after he saw Places in the Heart, we had a screening of Places in the Heart in 19, early 1984, and Lawrence Kasdan came up to me and said he was going to do a Western, and he wanted a black hero in it. He didn't want, he said a black Western, he said a, a Western with a black hero in it. And I did a lot of research on 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 the West and what it really looked like, you know, you know. In fact, I, in fact, the before before 19, the 1920s, America's primary contribution to world literature was the Western novel. And and so I mean, just the Western novel. And in that in that place in that space that the Western novel created, you saw all kinds of people in it, whether it's Chinese, or Jews, or African Americans, and uh, all uh, Mexicans and everything. They populated the real West. They were, they were more than just, you know, Randolph, uh, Scott, and, and John Wayne, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> His images in, in the West, you know? So I, I think that there's a one thing, the opportunity to do that and understand the um, the West in a different way, you know, and 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 to do that was was one of the things, the great things that came out of that as well. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, my, more questions? yeah, my second question is actually something I'm stealing from some Bravo interviews I had seen, um, and I've adapted it a little bit because I have had a little crush on you. I <laughs> I wanted to know. Um, as maybe one of your favorite characters, what would be the best thing he might say to a young woman or lady? Well, as one of my favorite characters, you know, it's funny because when people say, what's, what's, the, what's the, uh, um, the movie, what's the movie that you like the most that you've done? You know, it, it, it'll always be placed in the heart. Uh, simply, not, not, not be, well, yes, because it's, <laughs> it was my first major role, but also my work is dedicated to my mother and that. And so things happened in such a way. I was living in New York in April of 1983. And I, I came home uh, to San Francisco, and I spent time with my mother, and I spent time with my mom and dad. And my mom, 
who's just, man, she's the one, she was great, she was great, she was just amazing, my mom. You know, and I remember the first time my mom saw me, <laughs> on her back, she said, she came backstage with her, son, in a little small community theater, the people said, you can act. <laughs> it was so, you it, it was so precious. It was so, that's how she went to yeah, well, she'd always like to take me in and say, oh, what you mean, my son, Danny? He's an actor, you know what I'm saying? But she, she said, you're going to do a movie in September that's going to change your life. And it's going to be about you. And, uh, and I took that in. And then I remember uh, getting places in the heart, the script. And I was on my, it was in an empty room on my agent's floor. And I was sitting on the floor reading the script. And everything in that film resonated about, you know, memory and everything else. Um, because I had this kind of, in some sense, I had this kind of dual lives and where parallel lives that coincide with each other or that just intersect with each other. My mom, was born in rural Georgia to, to farmers, mother and father who were sharecroppers when they started, when they were married, tenant farmers. They eventually, because my grandmother, her mother was a midwife, they eventually would save up money and bought their own farm. And my mother always, with a, a, a moral, part of my moral underpinning was my mother said that she would always be eternally grateful for her mother and father because she didn't pick cotton in September, she went to school in September. That's a seizure. So hypothetically, you could say that I'm sitting here in front of you today because my mother didn't pick cotton in September. She graduated from college in 1942, migrated to New York after teaching a year of school, and then met my dad, and they ended up in San Francisco at the end of the war where he was discharged and they stayed. So those are the kind of things. And so I had this very, very close relationship with my grandparents. I mean, my mother would take, we'd go and see them all the time. In fact, when I was like two years old, I lived with my grandparents from the time that I was, uh, from, uh, I, from the time I was six months old to three years old, I lived with my grandparents. And on that farm was my grandfather's 90-something-year-old mother who was born in 1853 and was freed by the Emancipation Proclamation during the time I was there. So on the one hand, those are the kind of, what I call, I think I, think I talk a great deal about psychic history or emotional history and everything. So those are part of my emotional life. And so when I read this script, I said, my God, I said, Mom, I, I think this is the movie. And I said, it reminds me in my images, images, the images remind me of my grandfather, your father, my grandfather. And the images remind me of so many things that I, I, I can, I have, they're visceral, I mean, they're, 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 they're part of my, they're subconscious rather, they're subconscious, and they're stuff I feel, and you know, I felt a long time in my life, and the images there remind me of that. Well, my mother, on the day that I received the information that I was gonna do the movie, do the movie. My mother died in an automobile accident on her way back home to see her mother and father. And so it was. It was while well, like the most traumatic thing I had the rare opportunity that we get as an artist to to uh, uh, to how you I would say to to contribute something or to say something uh, about. I mean, this woman I was incredibly in love with. You know, my mom. And to be able to say that in my work. So I said, I'll let, I told you this story, and all I to say is that, in some sense, find something that's connected to you. You know, that was, in some sense, Robert Bookman didn't know he was going to select me for that role. You know, he didn't know he was going to do that. But I, if in some way, the role came to me in such a way, and it gave me an opportunity to pay homage to my mother. It gave me an opportunity uh, to pay not only homage to to uh, 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 them, but when my grandfather saw it, he said, boy, he forgot, he was 90 something, 
But you know my big God. I said, Grandpa, I was out there getting in your way out there in the cotton field when I come down. <laughs> when I would come down there, there to see you and everything. At least I'd get out of the way. I was like they're trying to bust over to one of those watermelons and eat the heart out of it and feed it to the hogs, you know what I'm saying? But but that's those are the kind of things that that, that certainly were when I say that all those kind of things make up me. I'm a, I'm, 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 uh, I'm totally community based. I've lived in the Haight Ashbury since I was 11 years old. You know, I live about 10 blocks away from my, where I grew up as a kid, you know, near Golden Gate Park. And I've been, you know, that's, that's basically me, you know. So, in some sense, I, I, I found a way in which I could, I could use art um, to, 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 to frame my relationship with this business and at the same time to try to live my life. Silverado are probably my favorite movies. Um, my question is about Silverado. I know you talked about this a little bit already, but what is your favorite or best memory of working with such a phenomenal cast in that movie? Well, I, I, I just working with the cast themselves. You know, I, I remember <laughs> Larry. Larry has this kind of tone. It's almost like a monotone in his voice. He's not, so it's, it's a nasal kind of, kind of it, it, in his, in his, uh, it, he talked to it like a, kind of has a nasal effect when he speaks. But Larry would say, man, there are a lot of great actors, but there's only a few you can live with for six months. <laughs> <laughs> so I think all of that, you know, every, every, the, the moments were just working out something, rehearsing and doing something on a daily basis, you know. I mean, it was six months. I mean, six months that we went in New Mexico shooting that. And it was a great, great experience, you know. It was just a wonderful experience, you know. Um, the stuff that came out of that, the, um, the movie itself, uh, and then, you know, the, the publicity, the touring, the, the Columbia uh, put a lot of energy and resources into. So, every, every moment was, you know, we, we worked together, we ate together, and then when, on Saturday night, because we're working six days a week on that film, you know, we, you know, you know, actors would pitch you, uh, you know, they get angry you get to work six days a week now, but work six days a week on that film. And just everything, everything on that film was just really, and it was, you felt like you were doing something special, basically. It was, it was, so thank you very much. You know, I mean, that's the good thing about it. Sometimes when you do something, like I remember the first week of Weapon, you just felt like you were doing something special. And primarily of the relationship between Mel and Dick Donald, the director, and myself. That's what made it so special. Thank you. Any other gentleman over right here? What was your other favorite role? Well, for other, other favorite role, I mean, uh, the other favorite role for me, perhaps, places in the heart. And and you had to put Lethal Weapon in there. I, there's so many, it's so hard to say. Um, but a, movie, a film that I had as much fun doing, for other reasons, was Predator 2. <laughs> and and there's an interesting story about that too. Because uh, I was in Chicago doing a play at Steppenwolf Theater. In, in Chicago doing a play. And I received 
three other scripts. And one of the scripts was somebody who played a pimp. And based upon all the commotion around it, around uh, the color purple, I couldn't play a pimp. <laughs> that, that was not going to be my next role. Even though it was, it, 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 it was a, a, I think, a brilliant role, brilliant, you know, I could have done something with it, but I just couldn't play a pimp. The other one was about a high school teacher. And the, the, next, the third one I got was a role in Predator One. And I couldn't, I couldn't read that either. I couldn't play that anyway because there's a scene in it, if you remember Predator One, where Carl yeah. Weathers become very violent with the woman in Predator One. And so uh, I couldn't, I could, I couldn't do anything. When I got to Chicago, Chicago was was what you saw, uh, what you would call a uh, central station for all discussion around color purple. <laughs> Wherever you go, people were talking about color purple. Color purple it is. Everybody was talking about color purple. They would have meetings at churches and meetings. <laughs> What's color purple, 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 purple. So I couldn't do anything. I wouldn't want to do anything that involved me mishandling a woman. That's the first one. <laughs> and then after that, after that came lethal weapon. After I turned those other three things down, then came lethal weapon. And 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 so when Predator 2 came along, and I, I was shooting Flight of the Intruder in Hawaii, and Predator 2 came along, and my, my agent called me, and I mentioned Arnold Riffin called me, and said, hey man, don't, don't, don't jump into conclusion, but we're going to do Predator, they're going to do Predator 2. Uh, Arnold, Arnold's not going to do it. And they want you to, they were offering it to you, with the same writers, the same, Groups, everybody's in it. Everybody who's in the first, who did the first one, worked behind the scenes, writers, technicians, everything, special effects guy. We're going to be in this one. So I said, let's go. And I, I totally did. I, you could, you could say, I'm pretty much, I stay pretty healthy and, and, and fit. I exercise a great deal. In fact, you know, I was in the gym this morning, but I do a lot of cardio stuff and. And at that time, I could still like run four miles on the sand in the beach. So I was working out, and I had never lifted weights before. And so I got a trainer. We lift weights and everything else. And Predator too, man. I wouldn't go get as big as Arnold, but I, I can, I can, I can, I can service my own frame, you know. And so I, I was feeling great, man. You know, I was feeling, I was feeling like I was the, I was the man. And it's something that, that's something about acting too, because once you become immersed in the in the character, you become the character, you know. And I call it this process of immersion. And, it, and, and whether you're on stage or whether you're doing film, there's a process that you go through as an actor where you become, in, 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 in essence, you become centered. You become the character, and, and you become within the framework of the film, indistinguishable. So, when I did that, so that was, that was great, you know. Beloved was interesting, was fascinating for me. Because I think it, it's probably the most important film I've done, Beloved. Because of what the story it tells. Now if you saw 12, 12 Years of Slave, watch that and you can probably go, go back and look at Beloved and get another sense of that, you know. In the sense that 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 what what the system itself, the, the pain, the the uh, the guilt, the fear, and anger, all that stuff, in the sense, uh, the system of slavery represented as well. Okay, and you have a question? Yes, I do. Um, my name is Erin. Um, my first impression of you was in the color purple. Um, I thought you were a scary person <laughs> until I saw the weapon and then saw all of them, and it was a running thing with my friends and I. But um, the question I have is: Do you have a favorite book that kind of changed your perspective on 
a certain subject or your life or something like that? I don't, I don't know if, you, if, if it's singular, you know. I think in life you, you, uh, you often find yourself in, in, a, in, a, in a, let's say, in a, in a thoughtful, evolving life, in most ways, which most majority of us live, you know, whether, we're, whether we find things to reinforce our beliefs, or we find things to, to steer us in a particular direction. There, there's several, there are books throughout, at each particular stage in my, my, my development, these books have been, have allowed me to, uh, to do that, you know, since I'm trained, trained as an economist, the early books for me were books around economics, you know, whether it's political economics or anything else, and reading those books, understanding and studying those books uh, were, were, were the things that further governed the rest of the first part of my life. And, and, and often they, they're often associated with, with um, various, various elements centered around change, you know. Um, if you ask me what's in, 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 in my, my, uh, my bag of books that I, that, I, that I carry with me, one of the things that's always with me, and I would say that, that it's always reinforcing me, is that I have a, a couple of books uh, on, on Martin Luther King's speeches. I have, I have at least two books in my bag right now, in some books right now. So at some, at some point in time, I, I, I read that as something in, in, in clarifying or something in, in reflective in some sense, because his words are simply prof prophetic, and not only uh, not only uh, are, are we were important at the time of his death more than uh, more than 45 years ago, but I think they resonate now as well. So if there's if there's one particular thinker. That that certainly at one particular point in time that that, it, that uh, I do that, um, uh, that part of the King. I, I just wrote. I just a, a great friend of, of, of uh, mine, great friend of mine, just died about three weeks ago. That's in Hardy, and he was a primary. He was 82 years old. He's a primary speech writer for Martin Luther King, and I even always used to talk with him think about it because he's written some extraordinary stuff on King and everything else. So if you're reading King, you're going to read Gandhi, <laughs> you're going to read those kind of things, those the books that in some sense, in sense try to kind of shape the way who you are. You know, I, 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 I this is around the 15th year that I graduated from high school, I spoke at, um, um, I, at, at, at about two high school two high school graduations, you know, and, and offered, you know, and, and I thought about, the, in, the, in the conversation, I think about my own movement, or my own evolution from that process, you know, and books become that for me. I just happen to be, you know, books and articles, you know, I'm fascinated by, by uh, education and the ideas around education, you know, and, and around there, and, and still, I still read um, um, various books around economics, you know, situations, thinkers around that, you know. A friend of mine who's an economist just gave me, just gave me the title of a new book I can't wait to get into, you know. And so, yeah. Oh, and then one other question. Are, you ever, are there any plans for you doing um, anything for Oprah um, for the master class? Uh, no, uh, she has a master class? Yeah, well, yeah, it's like a, a, it's a show on her own, it's called Master Class, and she has all the, like, uh, she had Morgan, Morgan Freeman and uh, Whoopi Goldberg, and, oh. yeah, it's, in, it's, yeah, it's something. No, oh, that's great, that's great. I have, I, I, I didn't hear about it, it's the first time I heard about it. Just curious. All Thank right, you. Thank you. Uh, we have a question over here. Mr. Gover. Uh, my name is uh, Danny also. <laughs> uh, thank you for all your great work. Um, question. Um, something in regards to one of your other really challenging uh, roles from uh, kind of like uh, Predator 2, that of uh, Lethal Weapon 4. Um, I just wanted to know, I just have an interest in, 
Uh, was it, how was it? It was really brutally challenging working with Jet Li uh, with all the fight, various fighting scenes, including the showdown. Any painful moments? Using anecdotes. Oh man, it, 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 in fact, he's, he's the sweetest man. He just has a beautiful heart, man. And uh, it was fun. I mean, it, it, Jet was about Jet Li was about 35 then, so. But they say when he was younger, he was much quicker than <laughs> I can't imagine that, boy. It was, it was something very special to watch, you know, and to be a part of, you know. Um, and the, but the nice, the beautiful thing about this is that, you know, all the, uh, all the stuff that we did underwater and all the stuff that, that seems like it's on a pier, that was on Warner Brothers' set. It was not in San Pedro. At 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 at, at, uh, at at three, four o'clock in the morning. You know what I'm saying? It was not in San Pedro. And so what, what happened is that Dick Down and we all have been just tired of doing night shooting. You know, that first part of Lethal Weapon 4 where I'm in the shorts, so that's that shot, and that's a night shot. But we were all tired of doing night shooting. And Dick did not like to, Dick Donald did not like doing night shooting. So he had this, the Warner Brothers built a tank, which must be, a tank must have been about 15 feet high with water in it. And we shot everything under there. Shot everything on the set. I had, we had a, our, our, our um, you know, massage therapist, people stretching us and everything else like that. So it was beautiful, it was wonderful about that, you know. You know. We get we 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 get to the set at seven and we leave by seven. Yeah, yeah. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. You have a question, sir? Yeah. I'd like to start by thanking you for Lethal Weapon. They don't make movies like that anymore, and they've tried many times and haven't got it right. Um, but my question is about Predator Two. Uh, I know that you said Arnold passed on the on the second one, and they, they turned the reins over to you, which you took really well. <laughs> and uh, but I was wondering, I know Arnold likes to turn everything into a competition. So have you seen Arnold since Predator Two, and how did he feel about you taking the reins from him on that? I mean, I mean Arnold and I would see each other quite often because we both involved in Planet Hollywood. He was cool with it, man. There was no problem with it. He had moved on. You know what I'm saying? No, we had moved on. He had moved moved on, you know. I'm glad it was available to do, you know. I'm just surprised that, that how many people have come to come to me with that that uh, uh, that uh, uh, with, with you know wanting a picture of or talking about Predator too, you know. It's a great line, Jesus, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Some of them we can't pronounce. We, we, we can't we can't offer to the audience because the language, but you know, you know, someone just gave me one uh, uh, it, it, today, you know, and, and it's, honey, honey, she gave me a line saying, hunting predators, I don't know if it's in, hunting predators is hard work, you know, <laughs> yeah. or uh, uh, who's next, all right, who's next, okay, who's next? <laughs> it's a great stuff, man. That's right. sometimes you get the best line, silver out. I don't want to kill you, and you don't want to be dead. <laughs> 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 uh, that's a great I don't want to kill you, and you don't want to be dead. <laughs> um, All right, and we have a question over here. <laughs> Hello, my name is Andrea, and I just. Uh, I wanted to do this for my mother. She's actually in the back. She's too shy to come up and say hi to you herself. Her name's Susan. But I do want to ask, um, during your career, you played a lot of authority figures. And I was wondering, is there ever a point in your career where you felt that you were typecast? Then I thought I was what? Typecast. Well, I, 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 don't, I don't think, uh, yeah, I think there was a point in my career when I was always cast as huge, most of the time, someone who, was as older than I really am, you know. <laughs> and that happens now. Somebody wanted me to play some role when I was 92. I said, well, that's a little stretch right now. <laughs> you know, that's a little stretch for me, you know. Uh, but, you know, when I did the first Lethal Weapon, I was 39, I'm playing 50, you know. And that, that's always been, 
the, the MO for me, you know, in some sense. But I remember when, in the first play I did when, uh, in 1967, I was 20, and I was playing the father of a teenage girl. So I, I think it's kind of like started, it, it had its roots in the beginning way back, way back. Genres. I mean, you worked with a guy in a predator suit, and you've made people sob. And I, I you know, I just want to know if you have a certain method to getting back and forth. I, 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 I um, there's something about there's something about acting in some way that um, that, that, that I think, think transcends genres, you know, in terms of your preparation, you know. There's a way in which I think, I, 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 for example, I did a movie called Switchback, um, and where I played a serial killer. So I read everything on about there was about serial killers. And the FBI has a special, a special section around serial killers. And the stuff that you learn is phenomenal because they never catch the A guys or the A plus guy. You know, the guys they catch are like the, the guys who are B, B minus, you know, guys. I'm mean, even giving them a grade. So when I when I worked on the film, I tried to I tried to figure out where where I can ground, and he uses word immerse, where I can ground the character. From theater, you learn to ground the character in some sort of physical action, or the, the physical something, the physicality of it, whatever, you know. Um, if your feet hurt during the whole play, then the character's whole emotional life is situated in his feet. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, I remember when I did switch back, and I was trying to find something to center the character. And I was talking to a friend of mine, and he was saying that his Qigong master could knock you over from across the room. Literally knock you over. His, his Qi, the word Qi was so powerful. Qi, his Qi was so powerful. So I'm up in the Rockies here, and then I decided, for some reason, I decided I wanted to take Pilates. Now in 1995, you know, not a lot of men were taking Pilates. You know what I'm doing? So I felt, I went to this place and I went to, started taking Pilates. And I felt something happening with me. I felt something happening with my body. And where my body became centered in a certain way. And my movement became centered in a certain way. So. And usually what I do is, 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 is also part of my preparation is that I'll have a, some sort of music or something that I identify. In this case, it's a really beautiful piece, uh, standard, by John Coltrane called Equinox. And, and that, that I, so I centered everything around here. So I've had, in my trailer, I've been playing Equinox. Da da da, bum, 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 da da da. So I, I would play that in my trailer, and I was taking Pilates. So I found that's where I wanted my body to be. I found the kind of ease where I want my body, the ease move. And the guy had, he was a cowboy, you know what I'm saying? So I began to sit there, sometimes I'll do that. And I'll sit around, and beloved, it was around the clothes. Every, sing, every single piece of clothes I had had its own story, and I made the, his, the story itself. So everything, I, I took this off this dead man. I took this off this, I found these shoes. I did, I did all, every single thing, everything. So one of the things that I'll do is I'll try to do that. Center the character. So whatever he does, whatever action he does, whether it's comedy, or whether it's physical action, or whatever, I'm able to, to kind of 
find this, the center of it. And I think I learned that. That was a word of lesson I learned in, in, in theater. And I also learned in, chant, in, uh, in dance as well. Because when I, when I did movement, you know, somebody just mentioned Morgan Freeman. No, Morgan Freeman used to be in a dance troupe early on. So in movement, what I did was I found some way of regulating or being able to, to kind of uh, organize my body. You know, and I'm like 6'3", over 6'3", so I'm trying to find some way to make my body feel comfortable with my body. And that's the key to it. So, and the key to that is, is acting is, is, I think, the key to acting is, is listening. And the, and the key to listening is relaxing. Because you can't listen if you're not relaxed. So, all those are kind of things that I employ at some point in terms of centering the character and finding the character and everything. Sometimes they come spontaneous, you know, you know, in some sort of way, in places in the heart. I, I know what it felt like. All I had to do was recall in my past memory what it felt like being around the farm, what it felt like, you know, that, that, that moment in time, you know, for me, you know, some, some, something that I call on that. So, but the key is that whatever you find in the actors and actresses here, and, and I'm sure there are plenty of actors and actresses around here can give you certainly value, a lot of valuable uh, information working there. The key, the key is basically trying to find ways in which you use yourself. Thank you so much. All right. We just had a quick moment in line. Do you have any projects that uh, you're, uh, you're uh, working on that you want to talk about really quick? Well, I, yeah, I'm working on this film for Paramount right now up in Vancouver, which I have to I have to be there tomorrow night, um, uh, and it's it's called it's it's one of those big summer movies. It's called Monster Truck. You know, it may be under Formula M, but you know, they think very highly of it. Well, good. I look forward to seeing that, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. One more time, let's have a big, warm, loving hand for Mr. Danny. Thank you so much for being here, sir. I hope you had a great time here. We love you, and you have a wonderful rest of your weekend. And you all have a fantastic rest of your Comic-Con!